Welcome everyone. Uh, I am happy uh, to have uh, our speaker today at our Barnard Computer Science Seminar is Dr. Omolola Ogunyemi, who is a Barnard alum, class of 1993. Um, she was uh, one of uh, two computer science majors in her year, as she remembers, and the other one ended up uh, changing majors. So she was a brave soul and um, uh, now we actually have uh, many, many computer science majors. We have currently about 160 declared majors and that is a dramatic increase in the last few years. Um, so exciting to see that development, but also exciting to see how some of our earlier computer science majors have gone on to uh, successful careers that incorporate their computer science learning into, um, into their lives. And uh, so Dr. Ogunyemi is a computer scientist and biomedical informatics researcher. She is a professor in the Department of Preventive and Social Medicine at Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science in Los Angeles. She's also director of the university's Center for Biomedical Informatics, which focuses on providing biomedical information solutions that me benefit medically underserved communities. And um, she will be talking to us about her work along those lines. Uh, tackling diabetic ret ret retinopathy in a safety net healthcare setting with telehealth and machine learning. And with that, I will turn over to you, Dr. Oganyemi. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Just call me Lola. It's fine. <laughs> and um, welcome to all of you. Since we're a small group, I, I was wondering if we could just, if you could just, you know, say your name and kind of what led you to be interested in computer science. And feel free, you can also put things in the chat if you'd prefer right. to, uh, to be course. heard, but we're happy to do it either way. Okay, so one person is in the library and of course can't <laughs> speak out in the library, but if you put it in the chat, that's fine. <laughs> um, hi, uh, my name is Katya. I'm a sophomore and I'm a computer science major. Um, and I first got interested in computer science because um, both my parents are engineers. So at uh, home, we'd have lots of like puzzles and like brainy games. Um, and so, you know, I was kind of immersed in like the STEM world from a young age. Um, and then I've got an uncle who is a computer scientist. And for my, I think, 11th birthday, he gave me like a beginner's Python book. And oh. since then I was hooked. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Does anyone else want to share? Uh, I can go ahead. Um, so I first encountered code in high school. And from what I remember, it was the most intuitive thing I've ever done. And so I thought, might as well do it. Um, and here I am. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. <laughs> Okay, I won't, I won't pressure anyone else. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my journey. So, um, oh, so May is saying that she's in the library, but for her, she took a CS course her freshman year and loved it and stuck with it. So I actually got interested in, in, ah, okay. Is it Zhu King? Is that close? <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to butcher your name. Okay, so I say she's not a CS major, but she enjoys the logical process of coding. Thank you all for sharing. So this is, this is really great. So I got interested in computer science. I'm originally from Nigeria and my family moved here when I was in the 11th grade. Uh, my mom is a literature professor and she was at Amherst College. And so I was at uh, Amherst Regional High and I took a computer, I took a programming class in a language called Pascal, which I don't think any of you, well, maybe Rebecca, but I don't think anybody else would have ever heard of it. And I was absolutely hooked. It was just, it was just so thrilling to be able to write code and have, you know, have things work. Oh, one person has heard of it. <laughs> so yeah, I never used it outside of that high school coding class because you know when I start when I started college, it was Lisp scheme it was, it was you know many other different languages but i really got i was really interested in uh, coding really enjoyed that class and so i decided i would major in computer science in college 
And one of the great things about Barnard, as you know, is as <laughs> a liberal arts school, I was able to take, so all the computer science classes were in the School of Engineering at that time. There was no, there was no department. And so I could take school uh, classes in the engineering school and uh, still take, you know, literature and other things. Oh, wow. Rebecca's first year uh, class was taught in Pascal. <laughs> yeah, by the time I started, I think they, they switched to scheme, I, I believe. So um, I really enjoyed uh, coding, went, you know, uh, was a computer science major at, at Barnard. And when it got time, when it was getting close to senior year, I was kind of thinking about what to do next. And I knew I wanted to go to graduate school. And I thought I wanted to do 3D graphics. And so there was Steve Finer at Columbia and there was a group at the University of Pennsylvania who did 3D graphics. So I thought, you know, maybe I'll go, you know, do 3D graphics, um, work for Disney or Pixar, and that would be great because I love 3D movies. <laughs> so I love animation. And so that's really where my head was at. I wasn't really thinking much about a you know, future. And I certainly didn't think I would end up in academia. So I'm, I'm prefacing this, you know, just be open <laughs> sometimes to, you know, where life takes you. So I um, interviewed at, so I got into Columbia for graduate school and UPenn and uh, went to campus at UPenn to, you know, so I was already used to New York and I, you know, went to Philadelphia. And I was talking to uh, faculty members in that school and really liked it and decided I wanted to go to school there. They had a number of women professors I was telling Rebecca earlier, and that was really you know, attractive to me. And then when I started at Penn, they had these seminar series where you know, different professors would present on their research work and you know, invite students. And there was a trauma surgeon and a radiologist in the computer science department. I'm like, what are they doing in the computer science department? So I was, I was curious. And that's what led me to a career in biomedical informatics. So my curiosity got the better of me. And I ended up in biomedical informatics because they were basically looking at how to use computing in a way that could help patients, nurses, uh, doctors. And I was like, that's really cool. I never had any desire to go to medical school, but I really liked the idea of something that helped patients or providers. And I, th I thought that's pretty much where I want to be. And so I essentially carved out a, a biomedical informatics major within a computer science department. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I went on from, um, I, I did my thesis on, I built a, a, a system that used 3D graphics. So 3D models of anatomy, um, combined with Bayesian networks, bringing those two things together to help people think about trauma injury because the trauma surgeon became my thesis co-advisor. So my advisor was a computer scientist, but my co-advisor was a trauma surgeon. And that work led me to my first uh, job in academia at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So it was a research faculty position at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And I was there for almost eight years. And so my work led me to write a lot of NIH grants and um, sort of do work that looked at how you could use computing to impact clinical care. But one of the things I noticed is I was ending up doing a lot of uh, sort of proof of concept systems that would never actually be used in a clinical setting. And I was like, oh, that's, that's not so great. And so the opportunity to work at Charles Brew came along because they were looking for someone to lead a new center for biomedical informatics. So I'll talk a little bit about Charles Drew and, and one of the reasons why I went there. So CDU, my current institution, um, is named after Charles R. Drew, who was a blood banking pioneer, um, a, a physician and professor at uh, Howard University, who incidentally started out at Amherst College. So it's named after him. It's a private nonprofit, uh, historically black graduate institution, but and it's also a Hispanic serving institution. It was rated by the Chronicle for Higher Education as one of the most diverse, um, I think the third most, second or third most diverse uh, uh, college in the US. So our student population is about 34% African-American, 33% Latino, 20% Asian, and then the rest, you know, it's like Native American, white, and 
uh, other groups. So it's a, it's a very diverse student population. It started out as a graduate school, which is why it's designated as a historically black graduate institution. But now we have some undergraduate or um, majors, but it's mostly graduate. Uh, students that are Charles Drew. So uh, Charles Drew was established in 1966 after the Watts Rebellion in Los Angeles. And one of the reasons for the rebellion was uh, limited access to quality health care. And um, so the university's mission in keeping with that uh, sort of being uh, developed in the aftermath of this uh, uh, rebellion, was, uh, the university's mission is to graduate diverse health uh, professionals who are dedicated to social justice and to health equity for medically underserved populations in the US and um, outside the US. So my center, the Center for Biomedical Informatics was established in 2007. And the goal was to develop informatics solutions for medically underserved communities and I thought that was a great goal, but I didn't know what that meant at the time. <laughs> and so my center is funded by a mix of NIH grants. Uh, we have an N uh, NIH endowment at CDU for the center, as well as state and foundation grants. And so the people, the, the faculty and staff in my center have backgrounds in computer science, internal medicine, sociology, and public health. And so, um, I'll say a little more about Charles Drew. So on the right is a picture of one of our um, medical school classes. So uh, I mentioned to Re Rebecca earlier, our medical students start their first two years at UCLA. So it's a joint program. And then their last two years at Charles Drew focusing on clinical settings that are uh, underserved. And so uh, the university is located in Los Angeles's service planning area six. So Los Angeles has eight service planning areas and service planning area six or spa six as it's popularly called over here has 1.1 million people who are predominantly Latino or African-American. And just to put that in context, so this one service planning area has more people than the state of Delaware, South Dakota, North Dakota, Vermont, Alaska, and Wyoming. So that's a lot of people, but for that area, we don't have a lot of hospitals, <laughs> clinics or medical specialists. So 32.5% of the adults in that area have difficulty accessing medical care versus 26.3% uh, uh, across the whole county of Los Angeles. And uh, SPA 6 is a HRSA designated health professional shortage area. It means there's just not enough providers and specialists and so that's why one of the schools, uh, one of the missions of the, the school is to try to graduate more nurses, doctors, physician, physician assistants, and so on. And so before I moved to LA, I had no idea what the, what the term safety net meant. So in, in the context of healthcare. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that because that shapes the discussion that we're going to have. And so the healthcare safety net in the US includes uh, federally qualified health centers, which are primary care clinics, and FQHC lookalikes, as well as state and county hospitals. And what's unique about these healthcare facilities is they provide healthcare to about 16 million people across the US and roughly 2 million in, in the state of California, regardless of their ability to pay. So these are mostly either uninsured or underinsured patients. And so this leads me to my first, um, introduction to what it means to try to use technology to help an underserved setting. So I, I came from uh, Boston to LA and uh, about a year in, the Dean of the College of Medicine was an ophthalmologist. So one of my colleagues was the medical director of one of the safety net clinics of an FQHC. So, so uh, associate professor of internal medicine, but also running a free clinic essentially. And he had a patient come in who had diabetes and he was really concerned about that patient's um, health in general. The patient's hemoglobin A1C or blood sugar levels were really high, which has implications for a number of things um, that could go really wrong. And one of the things he was concerned about for the patient was the patient's eyesight because um, diabetes can lead to uh, vision loss if it's not properly managed. And so, the federally qualified health centers or free clinics are primary care clinics. That is, 
they don't do specialty care and eye care is considered specialty care. And so in the safety net, what a primary care doctor would do is refer a patient to a specialist in a different setting. And so at the time um, I had started working there, the County of Los Angeles would be, would have the specialist that might be able to, you know, take on a patient who has diabetes from a free clinic and uh, assess whether or not they have any problems with their vision and then uh, treat them if they do. And so this uh, colleague of mine referred the patient who had diabetes to the county for, for examination. And the patient went on a waiting list because the county had its own list of, you know, long list of its own primary care clinics as well as specialty clinics. So they would do things on a first come first serve basis. So this person was on, on a long line of maybe about a thousand people ahead of him. And so he waited several months to get this appointment. And while he was waiting, he went blind. And that was absolutely shocking to me. I, I didn't think that that was possible. And everybody had done the right thing. He got the referral in time. The county got the referral. I was like, okay, we don't know anything about you. So we'll just put you on the line behind other people. So there was no way for anyone to know that he was at more risk than anybody else on that queue. And so um, I had a conversation with the colleague, a conversation with the dean, and then we wrote um, a supplement to an existing grant that we had at Charles Drew to look at teleretinal screening. And I'll talk about that as a, as a way to try to address this issue. So that project, which was uh, funded, I think it was 2009 or 2010, um, I'll talk a little bit about that because it shaped some of the later work that I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, today. So I'll give a little bit of a background on diabetic retinopathy, what this process for screening was like in inner city LA. I've already given you a taste of that before telemedicine was introduced. The goals of our study, um, some of the methods we use, results and discussion. So diabetic retinopathy is basically damage to the blood vessels of the retina in the eye caused by excess blood glucose. And if it's left untreated, it can essentially lead to vision loss, but it's absolutely treatable if it's detected early. And in fact, it's not just that it's treatable, if a patient is able to get manage their uh, blood glucose levels and get them to a pre-diabetic stage, diabetic retinopathy can be reversed. But it's very rare when someone has diabetes to get to a, get, get them to a point where their blood sugar is so well managed that they essentially revert to pre-diabetic stage. So it's the leading cause of blindness in working age adults um, in the US. And the images below from left to right show sort of a progression in terms of what a normal retina looks like to a, a retina that has proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So diabetic retinopathy progresses in stages from mild to moderate to severe to proliferative. And prolif at the proliferative stage, you have these fragile new blood vessels that grow and they're the ones that can break and bleed and lead to vision loss because they occlude vision when they, when they burst. And so laser photocoagulation therapy is used to sort of cauterize those blood vessels and prevent that from happening. So that's why if you get someone early, you get them into treatment, there's no need for them to have vision loss. So in the biomedical literature, there's lots of uh, information on the risk factors for diabetic retinopathy. One of those is the length of time a patient has had diabetes. That seems pretty obvious. So, so the longer you've had diabetes, the more likely you are to progress towards diabetic retinopathy. One is poor blood glucose control. Another is insulin treatment, especially if you have type two diabetes, because you know, that means things are in pretty bad shape. Um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetic kidney disease or nephropathy, uh, obesity, um, ethnicity, um, African-Americans and Latinos have had uh, more of a risk for diabetic retinopathy than other groups in the US. And smoking is somewhat controversial. So some studies have shown that smoking can increase the risk while others have shown no impact. So that's one of the risk factors that sometimes shows up in the literature, but there's a, a little bit of controversy about, about that one. So in 2009, on average, 60% of adults across the US with diabetes received annual screening, so annual eye exams, 
in accordance with American Diabetes Association guidelines. So everybody who has diabetes is supposed to get their eyes, have their eyes checked at least once a year. But in the inner city or in safety net settings, we weren't looking at a 60% rate of screening, we're looking at more of a 25% rate of screening, which means that a lot of people in uh, danger of uh, vision loss were not even getting screened and essentially wouldn't know that they were in danger. Because one of the unfortunate things about diabetic retinopathy for a lot of patients is that it's completely it's asymptomatic until it's too late. So many people don't know there's anything wrong until it's too late. So there's a lot of factors impacting the difference in the inner city versus national, you know, 25% or versus 60% screening rates at that time. One was a shortage of specialists for retinopathy screening in certain settings. You just don't have as many providers and as many ophthalmologists in certain settings. Uh, another is a large number of uninsured or underinsured patients. So people who are not even in the habit of seeing a doctor regularly because the cost would be too high. And then unfortunately, uh, you know, related to the fact that there's few symptoms for many people, patients own misconceptions about the utility of regular eye exams. Because if you, if you think you're fine, then you're not you know, going to subject yourself to an eye exam when you think that there's nothing really wrong with you. So I talked a little bit about that when I described how I got started on this project. Um, but this was the process pre-2010 for retinopathy screening. A, patient would be, a diabetic patient would be seen at a primary care clinic they'd be referred to a county facility. So um, the, the county is the biggest provider of uh, care to um, uninsured and underinsured patients in LA. And then four to eight months after referral, they would be screened by an ophthalmologist. And if they need treatment, they would be uh, returned for treatment. Otherwise they'd be asked to come back again in a year. So that's a screening process. And so we thought about teleretinal screening as a potential solution. So internationally, this was already very popular. And in the VA system, because the Veterans Administration deals with a lot of patients that have um, that are in rural settings where there's not a lot of providers. So they had to incorporate um, uh, telemedicine as a way to address um, uh, diabetes care. And so we knew from these settings that digital non meteoratic cameras, I'll show you what one of those looks like, um, had been successfully used. And you take a picture of the uh, retina and you can engage either an ophthalmologist or an optometrist to look at that retinal image and figure out whether somebody has diabetic retinopathy, what stage of diabetic retinopathy they have, if they have any, and then what to do next. And so it doesn't require the patient and the provider to be in the same room at the same time. And that frees up because if you don't have a lot of specialists in a particular setting, it means you can get specialists at other settings that can still do, do that work. So we got our pilot study funded by the NIH and our goal was to look at barriers and facilitators of using teleretinal screening to detect diabetic retinopathy in partnership with six uh, safety net clinics, federally qualified health centers. So we wanted to look at image quality, what proportion of the retinal images that were taken uh, were readable. So if an image is not readable, then it's not particularly useful because a provider can't make a diagnosis with it. And then we also wanted to know how acceptable teleretinal screening was to patients and clinic staff. So one of the things I learned early on in biomedical informatics is it's not just about getting things technically right, so you can build the best system and it has great accuracy and so on, but if people don't use it for whatever reason, then you have a problem. So part of uh, informatics is trying to figure out how to get patients or providers or whoever the intended users of a system are engaged and how to you know, basically figure out uh, what would make them use a system versus not. And so we wanted to know how acceptable teleretinal screening as a method for addressing this disparity in screening rates nationally versus in the inner city. We wanted to know how acceptable it was to both patients and to clinic staff. And so we had a sociologist on the project for that. Uh, we also wanted to look at the proportion of diabetic uh, patients who are at risk for retinopathy who received retinal screening annually. So in accordance with evidence-based guidelines that call for people to be seen annually. 
um, and who required and received uh, ophthalmologic treatment. So we obtained uh, uh, IRB approval from uh, Charles Drew's uh, review board and uh, signed memoranda of understanding between the six federally qualified health centers uh, and uh, Charles Drew's Center for Biomedical Informatics. So on our part from the grant, we purchased three digital non radiatic cameras for using screening. That meant that some of the clinics had to share a camera. So these are independent clinics that, you know, they, they're not connected to one another, but this was important enough to them that they were willing to send their patients to another clinic to get screened because they didn't want the patients to have vision loss. And so on the grant, we also retained three board certified ophthalmologists to serve as readers. So readers essentially look at the retinal image and say, oh, there's no retinopathy or there's mild or there's moderate and so on. And then we arranged photographer training and certification in partnership with uh, Dr. Jorge Cuadros, who is a biomedical informatician, as well as an optometrist at UC Berkeley. And he created a system called IPAX, which allows you to upload uh, retinal images and makes it easy for providers to view the images and grade them. And so we partnered with him and had him come to train um, the, the, the staff at the clinic. So uh, Charles Drew, took care of weekly monitoring of clinic sites and troubleshooting. And then one of the most important things, we arranged with the director of the county facility closest to this, these six clinics to expedite treatment for cases of moderate or worst retinopathy. So it wouldn't have made sense to go to all this trouble to refer somebody to the county and still have them be at the back of the line. And so what she agreed to was that if someone had moderate or worst retinopathy, they would be seen within three weeks. So we're talking about the difference between a several month long wait versus a three week wait. And that, that was really, um, really key uh, for, this, for this particular project. And what, they, what I learned was that if people had mild retinopathy, they could wait a year. It's not, it's not at a, it's, it could take years to go from mild to a, uh, a stage where you need immediate treatment. So this was the cutoff that they were making. So we, um, the clinics on their part identified staff, mostly medical assistants who would be trained on the cameras to take images of the retina. And they made the referrals to the county health facilities and then gave access to our study to medical records for abstraction. And so image taken for the study happened between 2010 and 2011. And we also uh, collected data for machine learning. I'll talk a little bit about that later, um, including patient demographic data, medical visit history, specialist referrals, and clinical values at multiple time points like hemoglobin A1C, blood, blood sugar levels, blood pressure, and weight. So we had three board certified ophthalmologists on the project that used the IPAC software developed by the Berkeley team to assess, assess the presence or absence of microaneurysms, retinal hemorrhages, hemorrhages, cotton wool spots. So things in the retinal image that would say, ah, this person has mild or moderate or severe, or I don't see anything bad, so they don't have any form of retinopathy. And uh, the other thing that the ophthalmologist did was grade the quality of the images that the medical assistants were taking, because if an image couldn't be read, if it was you know, too blurry or too dark, the photographers needed to know that so they could do better in the future. So I talked about the qualitative study. We had um, Sheba George, who's a, a associate professor, Charles Drew, and a sociologist. Uh, Allison Fish was a postdoctoral fellow in my uh, center. And Erin Moran was a PhD student who served as our project coordinator. She was a PhD student at UC Irvine, but uh, worked with us on the project. And so they did uh, focus groups with 42 patients from the six different federally qualified health centers and in-depth interviews with clinic staff because we wanted to know, what do you think about telehealth? So now, you know, we've gone through a pandemic and people are used to essentially remote visits but at that time, this was not the norm. And so this is what uh, a digital non meteoratic camera looks like. So it's a kind of huge like $28,000 camera, which is why the clinics were happy for us to partner with them because they would get to keep the cameras after we were done with the study and, and keep using them. And it's not something that would be in a uh, small free clinics budget to be able to buy. So these are just uh, study staff playing with the cameras. 
And so um, they had 9,400 patients at, across the six clinics, and we were able to uh, screen 2732 unique patients. Some uh, patients had to, about 134 had to come back because the image quality wasn't good enough the first time that the photographers took their images. But essentially, we're able to get a number of 1,000 uh, patients referred to a specialist, uh, some with proliferative and severe diabetic retinopathy. So th those are people that would need immediate treatment, and we're able to get them uh, the treatment they needed. And then uh, uh, moderate, which is also serious, they would be seen within uh, three weeks, but don't necessarily need um, immediate uh, surgical or other treatment. And then patients with mild retinopathy who could return in a year. But one of the good things about teleretinal screening is that we were also able to pick up people with other conditions other than uh, retinopathy because the uh, ophthalmologists and optometrists can see, you know, if you have uh, non-diabetic maculopathy, if you have cataracts, there's other things that they can still refer you for. And so 282 of the patients were referred for other things as a side benefit of being screened for the diabetic retinopathy. So some of the barriers that we found that were that the clinics didn't have the resources to integrate. So the, the best thing to do would be for a clinic to have a diabetic patient come in, see their primary care doctor, get a picture of their retina taken and you know, uh, move on. But many of the pa uh, clinics, because the people taking the images were medical assistants who help doctors with a lot of things, and so some of the clinics would say, we're gonna have set up a day like Friday for all the diabetic patients who need to get retinal images to come in and get their uh, picture of their eye taken. But if you had an appointment on Monday, you weren't likely to come back on a Friday to, to get a retinal image taken. So just not having the resources to integrate it into the primary care visit was one barrier. Another barrier was that patients sometimes didn't understand the reason for their screening visit. As you know, as we saw some, so when the uh, sociologist and uh, the rest of the team looking at qualitative issues talked to people, even though these clinics all had diabetic, diabetes education classes, many patients thought it was a visual acuity test for like glasses. Like they didn't, they hadn't made the connection between their diabetes and potential vision loss. So that was also uh, problematic. That was a barrier. And then on the uh, photographer side, you know, somebody could be a really great medical assistant, but not adept at using the camera, especially if they were only using it once a week. And so there was always a learning curve. And so um, our, the one of the ophthalmologists on our study set a, a, a rating cutoff for the uh, medical assistants who were doing photography. So if they couldn't meet a certain standard, to have a backup photographer replace them because you know they were just not able to get the quality of images that the uh, ophthalmologist would need to make a diagnosis. So facilitators were proactive medical assistants who were really willing to um, troubleshoot and clinic environments that rewarded photographer creativity for troubleshooting. So when the medical director was like, kudos, and not like, why did you do that? Um, and then acknowledgement of the importance of screening by clinic staff. So one of the important things at the beginning, you know, we, we met with people who were not, and the clinics who were not involved in the study to say, please don't pull people off of camera duty, because these are medical assistants, and a doctor might want them to do something else. And so having them honor that, made it more likely for um, the screenings to go smoothly with, without any uh, hitches. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about machine learning because one of the things you'll notice is that we were able to screen almost 2,700 patients. And that was, a, that was a really nice number of people, but that was nowhere near the total number of people with diabetes at those six clinics. And so one of the things that got me, uh, it got me thinking about um, what other ways we could figure out, you know, there's someone sitting at home with diabetes and doesn't know that their eyesight may be in danger. And so uh, I, I decided to look at machine learning on patients data and on risk factor data in the electronic health records of these six uh, clinics to see whether there was any way that just looking at those risk factors would tell us who might or might not have diabetic retinopathy. 
And so I found that an ensemble of classifiers, and I'll talk in a minute about what class imbalance is. So an ensemble of classifiers had a you know, moderate sensitivity, not that great specificity, an area under the ROC curve of 0.72. Where, so an AUC of one means that um, a classifier is really, really, really good. And 0.5 means it's no better than flipping um, a, a fair coin. And so um, with uh, adjusting for class imbalance, we could get a decent sensitivity, but if you didn't adjust for a class imbalance, and again, I'll talk more about that, you had 26% uh, sensitivity, but a very high specificity. So you have a model that's very good at telling you who doesn't have diabetic retinopathy, but not particularly good at telling you who does have it. But this sort of piqued my interest because I was like, okay, if you can't get people to come in, but you have their data, is there any way you can do targeted outreach? Like if you can still figure out from their data who's at high risk, can you get people to come in? And so this shaped a lot of the work that, um, I'm currently doing. So after our teleretinal screening study ended, the six clinics that we worked with continued to do teleretinal screenings for uh, diabetic retinopathy. They replaced the ophthalmologist that we had paid from the grant with optometrists um, because uh, cost-wise that would made more sense for them. The county on its uh, part rolled out a new referral process because the county is independent of these six clinics and many times the providers at the clinics would have to wait to hear back from the patients to know what was going on with their patients when they were in the county system. So with the e-consult system, the provider in the primary care clinic could at least see what was going on with their patient, have some idea of what was going on with their patient when they were referred uh, for specialty care. And one of the more important things is the county itself established a teleretinal diabetic retinopathy screening program and that program accepts patients from all safety net clinics in Los Angeles, and eventually will include all federally qualified health centers in Los Angeles. And the, uh, the uh, doctor that established that program was one of our board certified ophthalmologists on our study. So she was a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar at the time, and just saw the struggles and challenges that the clinics had and used a lot of the knowledge from this study to roll out a countywide screening program. I'll talk more about that. So these are the people who helped to make that initial uh, study possible. Lauren uh, Petty Daskovich is the board certified ophthalmologist I just talked about who, who now runs um, teleretinal screening for the entire county of Los Angeles. And there were many, many, many other people who made this initial study possible and it was funded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. We had a number of publications. So I told you the original study. So this was one of, it was very interesting in the sense that I had come from Boston, used to doing work on Bayesian networks and you know proof of concept systems. They were kind of cool. It's like a lot of graphics, flashy. And this was the first project that I had done that actually had practical impact on like over 2000 people's lives. But it wasn't particularly flashy. <laughs> it wasn't particularly, it was, it was kind of interesting. It, it was one of the more meaningful projects, but it, it wasn't in terms of technology, like, wow. But it made a lot of difference. So one of the things that I got out of that uh, initial study was there's got to be another way if still you have a lot of people who don't know they should be screened, but they come to the, they, they go to the clinic for other things and they're having blood sugar's drawn, they're having, you know, they, they're doing laps. They're just not realizing that, oh, my eyesight might be a danger or there are other consequences from diabetes. And so looking from that initial study on 513 patients, um, my colleagues and I got a larger grant from the National Institutes of, of Health, this time from the National Library of Medicine, which funds a lot of informatics uh, work. And so we were looking, so this is a partnership with uh, Charles Drew, the County of Los Angeles and uh, UCLA and a, a company called uh, Voxel Cloud. And so on Charles Drew's part, so this is what I was interested in, is looking at machine learning methods to detect diabetic retinopathy from data in patients' electronic health records. So our goal was to identify and reach out to high-risk diabetic patients that skip teleretinal screening because they don't know there's any danger of vision loss. And then we wanted to look at uh, measures of accuracy, like sensitivity, specificity, and error on the ROC curve of different machine learning strategies. 
um, on UCLA and Voxel Cloud's part, they were looking at deep learning with convolutional neural networks. So Google has really done a lot of great work in this space. They've been published in uh, JAMA and so on. Looking at digital retinal images and automatic staging and grading of diabetic retinopathy uh, using just digital retinal images. And this has been somewhat successful internationally where you don't have a lot of specialists. In the US, a lot of the problem is getting people to come in. <laughs> so that's why I'm gonna talk more about the first bullet, which is what uh, uh, the Charles Drew team focused on. So we partnered with uh, Los Angeles County's Department of Health Services. It's the lo second largest municipal healthcare system in the US, uh, second only to New York. And it caters to about 750,000 unique patients a year. 142,000 of them are uninsured about 85,000 patients with diabetes were seen between 2019 and 2020. So there's a lot of um, patients with diabetes. And the teleretinal screening program there has about 10 optometrists that look at these retinal images and uh, they have ophthalmologists do overreads just to make sure that everything is on track. And so the goal of that program is to annually screen all patients with diabetes and make sure they don't have diabetic retinopathy, or if they do, that they're appropriately managed. And so when teleretinal screening was introduced in 2012, uh, the screening rates in the county went from 37.7% then to 64% in uh, 2019, which is really good and better than the national average that I told you initially, which was 60, 60%. So just introducing this uh, technology got uh, screening rates in the uh, in an underserved setting clo uh, close to the national average. So this is the study team. Um, uh, uh, myself and uh, Dr. Ricky Tyra at UCLA were the principal investigators. Lauren Daskovich, who's the, uh, who's leads the teleretinal screening programs in the county, was a sub uh, principal investigator. And I won't go through every member of the study team, but it's a large, really great group of people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about class imbalance in machine learning because I've, I've mentioned that term before. And that is when we're interested in predicting an outcome using machine learning. And the outcome that we want to predict is not well represented in the data set. So that's often called a minority class. And sometimes this co-occurs with an overlap in the classes we're trying to separate. So if you have very unique features, even if something is underrepresented, you might be able to tease it out. But if the features are not as unique, if there's multiple things that could cause those features, it's, 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 it could be tricky. So standard machine learning classifiers have a bias towards a class that has a greater number of instances in a data set. So many uh, classification approaches assume balance. It assumes that you have, if you're, if you're doing, if you're, predicting one of two outcomes, that you have almost as many in your training set, almost as many examples of one as the other. But in medicine, you often find that you see more patients who don't have a particular condition than patients who have it. And this can become tricky. So are people familiar with two by two tables? So it's like a confusion matrix for a classifier. Okay, so essentially um, the four boxes represent whether a classifier says someone has a disease or doesn't have a disease. So um, going, going down from column two, so that's a machine learning classifier saying someone doesn't have a disease. Column uh, three says is the number of uh, people that the classifier says have a disease. And then going across from the third row, the number of patients who actually don't have the disease and the number of patients who actually have the disease. So in this case, we'll read the box as saying, there's 900 people who don't have the disease we're interested in and 100 people who do. And we have a classifier that essentially says, no one has the disease. It doesn't pick up anybody as having the disease. So if we have a data set that has 900 negative training examples, and 100 positive training examples. So 900 cases of people who don't have the condition we're interested in and 100 people who do have it. And we're trying to predict positive cases. We're trying to predict people who have the disease. This is an example of a class imbalance. And unfortunately, a standard classifier can get high accuracy by just saying nobody has the disease. So we'll, we'll see what that, 
means. So if I'm uh, measuring, uh, calculating accuracy in this case, even though my classifier says nobody has the disease, it achieves an accuracy of 90% because most of the people in the data set don't have the disease, but it has a sensitivity of zero. It's completely useless at picking out the disease I'm interested in, but a specificity of 100% is really great at telling me who doesn't have the disease. But in this case, I'm interested in who has the disease. So this classifier is essentially not good for detecting the disease, good for telling us who doesn't have it. And this is a problem that is often uh, that often emerges when you're doing machine learning with clinical data. And so there are many approaches to handling a class imbalance. You can modify a learning algorithm and to penalize instances of misclassifying um, the minority class, the class you're interested in, as uh, as uh, not being present. You can uh, use data preprocessing approaches, so majority class undersampling where you take the, the examples that are too many and you randomly reduce them so that you have a balanced uh, set of uh, positive cases versus negative, or minority class oversampling where you artificially boost the, 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 the small set of cases you're interested in to match the majority class. And then there's also cost sensitive approaches where you combine algorithm modification and data pre-processing or you can use ensembles of classifiers, you know, weak decision tree learners, for example, and essentially take the strength of each different classifier, because each classifier has different strengths, and together um, increase the accuracy of uh, uh, classification. So just a reminder from the pilot study results that I, I had uh, talked about, where we did machine learning on 513 cases. So I said, when I didn't adjust for class imbalance, uh, a Bayesian network had the best results and it had only 26% sensitivity, but very high specificity. So we just saw why that's not such a great thing. But when I used an ensemble of weak decision tree learners, I was able to boost the sensitivity, but at a really bad hit in specificity. So in this case, we had access to a lot more data. So we had access to data from uh, the County of Los Angeles's uh, Health Ser Services EHR system. So we had variables that correspond to known diabetic retinopathy risk factors from the literature and variables su suggested by clinical experts on our study that address different complications of diabetes. And so we're able to get data on 40,600 uh, total patients. So uh, 12,000 of them, or close to 13,000 of them had diabetic retinopathy, but the majority of them did not. So the data set had a class imbalance. And we also got an external validation set. So this is one of the things that's usually important in um, a clinical setting. You wanna show that when you create a classifier that it's not just good on the data set you trained it on, that it's, it generalizes to either a different population or a population that was not considered for the training, the original training and test set. And so we got data from about 9,300 patients, completely different from our training and test set that I previously showed you. Um, and so the, the folks seen in the training and you, whose data were used in the uh, training and set, test set were seen between 2015 and 2017. And the external validation, it was people, a unique group of people seen between January 2018 and December 31, 2018. So there was no overlap between these two groups of people. And we looked at all these different uh, risk factors from um, age, sex, race, marital status, ethnicity, um, you know, when they were diagnosed with diabetes, the body mass index and different uh, clinical measurements and whether they had hypertension or kidney disease and so on. And um, there's more information on this on in um, uh, a Jamia open paper. I think I sent a copy to Rebecca. So if anybody is interested in learning more, there's more details in there. And so we looked at several different classification methods, random forest, support vector machines, extreme gradient uh, boosting, an ensemble of different kinds of classifiers. So bringing together random forest, gradient boosting machines, and neural networks. And we also looked at deep learning with a deep neural network and applied two different uh, pre-processing methods, uh, majority class undersampling, where we're 
randomly reducing the number of uh, cases of no diabetic retinopathy to match the number of diabetic retinopathy, and then synthetic minority class oversampling, where we're boosting the number of diabetic retinopathy uh, cases. We also did feature subset selection because one of the things we're looking at is we want a system that clinicians can use. And we started out with about 31 variables and nobody's going to be pointing and clicking 31 different variables into a system. We just knew that working with uh, clinicians. And so when we performed feature subset selection, we came up with a, a feature subset of uh, about 14 variables that were uh, highly predictive on, on the data set. We also had to drop variables that had over 35% missing data um, for, for this part of the study. So we used both R and Python for our studies. Um, we handled miss missing data with imputation uh, using K-nearest neighbor imputation with a K of nine and uh, performed tenfold cross-validation on the training set, on a subset of the training set and held out 34% as a test set and tested the, the, to find the best uh, machine learning models. So on the test set, the best model was the ensemble of different types of classifiers um, with a sensitivity of 63%, a specificity of almost 80% um, using um, minority class oversampling. And then on the external validation set, so the set of patients who hadn't been previously seen, whose data was not used for training or testing, um, it had a sensitivity of 60%, so close to what it was for the test set and a specificity of 82%. So an AUC of uh, a 0.8 on the test set and a point, almost 0.8 on the external validation set. But when we looked at uh, majority class undersampling, we got even better results. So this is a different strategy and here, the best model was on the test set was a deep neural network with a sensitivity of almost 74% and specificity of uh, almost 73%. And uh, on the external validation set, so the uh, sort of unique group of patients seen between 20, uh, seen just in 2018, it still generalized well, still had a sensitivity of about 72% and a specificity of 74% and AUC of 0.8. And this is also in that paper. And so based on this, we, we created a, uh, using Python Flask, we created a web-based tool called DR Risk. It's the Diabetic Retinopathy Risk Assessment Tool. And it's essentially based on the deep neural network. It takes uh, the 14 risk factors and essentially gives uh, a patient's uh, risk of retinopathy from low to moderate to high. And so we further did uh, some study outreach uh, to about 31,000. So at the time we wrote the grant, you know, the screening rates had been really climbing in the county. So we thought, okay, it's just gonna be, you know, 35% of people who are supposed to come in that are not coming in and we're gonna reach out to them. Well, because of the pandemic, we had, there were complete pauses in screening. So we now had to reach out to 31,000 people, which was <laughs> way beyond what we had originally planned for. So it was 31,000 people who had missed an annual eye exam. So from the grant, we sent them mailers, robocalls, text messages. And um, we also applied the deep learning model to, uh, to the, their data and 75, 100 patients were identified by the model as being at high risk. And for them, we wanted to do targeted outreach. And so um, we had uh, bilingual, so the patient population was primarily Spanish speaking. So we had bilingual uh, health educators reach out to them and essentially try to get them in for screening. And we were able to get quite a number of people in for screening. So, cause I know I'm running, <laughs> It's sort of out of time. I want time for you to ask questions. So I'll just say that the work was uh, funded by the National Library of Medicine. And I wanted to give my email and a link to the DR risk tool that you saw if you wanted to play around with it. And I'm really happy to, you know, take your questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Oganyemi Lola. Um, that was really interesting. It's, it's always, um, inspiring to hear of the real world impact uh, that uh, that someone's work can have. So that's really exciting. Um, 
let's open it up. If we have questions, uh, you guys can put them in the chat. You can uh, unmute and ask the question. You can raise your physical hand and I'll look for it or raise your hand with the Zoom hand feature and I can find it that way. So any, any or all of the above should work. And maybe I'll get started uh, with one question, uh, which is, so if some of our, uh, let's say specifically our computer science major students are interested in going on to do this kind of work, um, what would you recommend they do as undergrads? So as undergrads, one of the things that they can do is, so there's um, the American Medical Informatics Association. It has a number of meetings annually and it has proceedings. So there's lots of papers that are available online or through PubMed, which is the National Institutes of Health um, um, sort of bibliography service. So to, to kind of look at some of those and see if there's anything that piques your interest. And on the upper campus <laughs> at Columbia, there's, there's a biomedical informatics uh, department. So, so they're, they're in a different campus. And there's a lot of really great people there that would be willing to talk to, to you know, to, to undergrads and kind of walk them through what informatics is. I'm also happy to do that. And so a lot of it is computing, but you have to have some interest or sort of uh, appreciation for the fact that in the healthcare setting, the stakes are a little bit different. And people can often be very conservative in terms of, you know, trying to make sure something doesn't negatively impact health. So it's not always the best accuracy that matters. It's, it's you know, they look at the totality of things, but it's a really, really interesting field. Yeah. Great. So I'm happy to take questions. There's a lot of literature on informatics and there's a campus, you know, not that far from Barnard where people can, you know, there's professors who can talk to people and they can learn more. All right, seeing no more questions then, I think we'll wrap it up for the day. And thank you again, uh, really enjoyable talk and appreciate your taking the time. It was my pleasure. It was nice meeting you all. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye.